Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio from Monday, November 1st, 2021. President Joe Biden telling the United Nations Climate Summit in Scotland that the science is clear about the threat of global warming and asking, will we act? Will we do what is necessary? Will we seize the enormous opportunity before us or will we condemn future generations to suffer? A majority of U.S. Supreme Court justices signaling they'd be willing to allow court challenges to Texas's new abortion law. We'll hear some of the oral arguments. There were two cases and get some perspective from Washington Post Supreme Court reporter Robert Barnes. Senator Joe Manchin, a needed Democratic vote in order to pass the latest version of the social spending plan, now $1.75 trillion, demands more time to study it before committing to voting yes. And again calls on the U.S. House to pass the separate $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill that has already passed the Senate. White House saying Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines for children ages 5 to 11 are now being packaged and shipped anticipating that the final okay will come this week from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. World leaders turned up the heat and resorted to end-of-the-world rhetoric on Monday in an attempt to revive sputtering international climate negotiations. That's how the Associated Press beginning its article. It goes on, the metaphors were dramatic and mixed at the start of the talks, known as COP26. For British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, global warming was a doomsday device strapped to humanity. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres told his colleagues that people are digging our own graves. And Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley, speaking for vulnerable island nations, added moral thunder, warning leaders not to allow the path of greed and selfishness to sow the seeds of our common destruction. AP goes on. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden and German Chancellor Angela Merkel avoided soaring rhetoric and delved into policy. Here's part of President Biden's speech at the summit in Glasgow, Scotland. In the United Nations, at the United Nations in September, I announced that my administration is working with the Congress to quadruple our climate finance support for developing countries by 2024, including significant increases in support for adaptation efforts. This commitment is made possible to each of our collective goals of mobilizing $100 billion annually for climate finance, but mobilizing finance at the scale necessary to meet the incredible need is an all-hands-on-deck effort. As other speakers today have mentioned, governments in the private sector and multilateral uh, development banks must also do their work to go from millions to, to billions to trillions the necessary effect of this transition. Today, I'm also submitting a new adaptation communication laying out how we'll implement the global goal of adaptation, as well as announcing our first-ever contribution to the Adaptation Fund. But our commitment is about more than just financing. That's a critical piece of it. But we're also going to support solutions across the board. In the lead-up to this gathering, the United States joined our G7 partners to launch a Build Back Better World initiative. We also reconvened the Major Economies Forum on Energy and Climate to launch transformative actions and to raise ambition. And together with the European Union, we're launching a global methane pledge to collectively reduce methane emissions, one of the most potent greenhouse gases, by at least 30 percent by the end of the decade. More than 70 countries have already signed up to support rapid reduction of methane pollution, and I encourage every nation to sign on. It's, it's the simple, most effective strategy we have to slow global warming in the near term. My friends, if we're to recognize that a better, more hopeful future of every nation has to do its part with ambitious targets to keep 1.5 degrees in reach and specific plans of how to get there, especially the major economies, it's imperative that we support developing nations so they can be our partners in this effort. Right now, we're still falling short. President Joe Biden at the International Climate Summit in Scotland. Ahead of his remarks, the White House unveiling its strategy for cutting U.S. greenhouse gases by half by 2030 and the U.S. achieving net zero emissions by 2050. At a session later in the day, President Biden apologizing for former President Donald Trump's withdrawal from the of the U.S. from the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement saying, I shouldn't apologize, but I do apologize for the fact the United States, the last administration, pulled out of the Paris Accords 
and put us sort of behind the eight ball for a little bit. President Trump announcing the move in 2017, it became official in 2020. And then when President Biden was inaugurated, he had the U.S. rejoin the Paris Agreement. More from today's summit, the leader of the host country, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, warning the world is at one minute to midnight, having run down the clock on waiting to combat climate change. The longer we fail to act, the worse it gets, and the higher the price when we are eventually forced by catastrophe to act, because humanity has long since run down the clock on climate change. It's one minute to midnight on that doomsday clock, and we need to act now. If we don't get serious about climate change today, it will be too late for our children to do so tomorrow. I was there with with many of you in Copenhagen 11 years ago when we acknowledged we had a problem. I was there in Paris six years ago when we agreed to net zero and to try to restrain the rise in the temperature of the planet to 1.5 degrees. And all those promises will be nothing but blah, 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 to coin a phrase. And the anger and the impatience of the world will be uncontainable unless we make this COP26 in Glasgow the moment when we get real about climate change. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, he referred to 1.5 degrees, so did President Biden. That's the goal of getting governments to commit to cut back on carbon emissions enough and fast enough to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The world has already warmed about 1.1 degrees Celsius, and current projections based on planned emission cuts over the next decade is for it to hit 2.7 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. Other goals for the meeting are for rich nations to give poorer nations $100 billion a year in climate aid and reach an agreement to spend half of the money to adapt to worsening climate impacts. British royal family members also speaking at this climate summit, including Prince Charles on Sunday. As we tackle this crisis, our efforts cannot be a series of independent initiatives running in parallel. The scale and scope of the threat we face call for a global systems-level solution based on radically transforming our current fossil fuel-based economy to one that is genuinely renewable and sustainable. So, ladies and gentlemen, my plea today is for countries to come together to create the environment that enables every sector of industry to take the action required. We know this will take trillions, not billions of dollars. Prince Charles at the United Nations Climate Summit in Glasgow, Scotland. A couple of other headlines from the conference. The Chinese President Xi Jinping not attending in person, but offering a written statement and no new commitments to cut greenhouse gases. He writes, China will continue to prioritize ecological conservation and pursue a green and low carbon path to development. China has already promised to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. And India's Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, committing his country to reach net zero emissions by 2070. India is the world's third largest emitter of greenhouse gases. This is Washington Today. Now to the Supreme Court. Today's oral arguments in a couple of cases involving Texas' new abortion law, which prohibits abortions after six weeks of pregnancy, also allows private citizens to sue anyone who violates the law, New York Times writes, after almost three hours of lively arguments, a majority of the justices seemed inclined to allow abortion providers, but perhaps not the Biden administration, to pursue a challenge to a Texas law that has sharply curtailed abortions in the state. Here's some oral argument from the first case, as Chief Justice John Roberts questioned the Texas Solicitor General Judd Stone about those private lawsuits you're going to hear it referred to as a bounty. I was just going to ask, uh, assume that the bounty uh, uh, is not $10,000 but a million dollars. Do you think in that case the chill on uh, uh, the conduct at issue here uh, would be sufficient to allow uh, uh, federal court review prior to the end of the state court process? 
No, Your Honor, because that wouldn't affect either the Article III or sovereign immunity problems in this case. Undoubtedly, it would increase the chill the same way that individuals who are exercising either protected or arguably protected conduct in a, in a host. But as I understand it, the, the only way in which you get federal court review uh, is, of course, for somebody to take action that violates the state law and then be sued under the law and then have the opportunity to raise their defense in federal court eventually. And you're saying it, that somebody is going to undertake that activity even though they're going to be subject to suit for a million dollars repetitively and, uh, uh, because uh, that doesn't exercise a chilling effect? That's not what I'm saying at all, Your Honor. What I'm saying is it doesn't expand access to the federal courts. There is still pre-enforcement review, I might note. There are currently 14 pre-enforcement review challenges pending in a multi-district litigation in Travis County State Court. So to speak to specifically your concern about federal court pre-enforcement access, no, that wouldn't change the Article III or sovereign immunity doctrines in play here. And that might very well be a reason why Congress could be moved to expand access to the federal courts either through the ordinary course or by using their Section 5 powers under the 14th Amendment. But even if the, the, the amount of the sanction, again, I agree with you, a million dollars would be tremendous. We could increase it further. No number would suddenly cause the federal courts to become more open. It's not a question of the federal courts being more open. It's a question of anybody having the capacity or ability to go to the federal court because nobody is going to risk violating the statute uh, because they'll be subject to suit for a million dollars. Uh, that, that takes a lot of uh, fortitude. Uh, uh, to uh, undertake the prohibited conduct in that case. And under the system, it is only by undertaking the prohibited conduct that you can get into federal court. Well, Your Honor, individuals, again, to the extent that we're dealing with the sorts of very high stakes, prohibited conduct, fines, sanctions, et cetera, I might add this is specifically a damages action. It is capped at much less than that. That is a significant yeah, difference. My, my question is a what we call a hypothetical. Of course, Mr. <laughs> Chief Justice. The Texas Solicitor General Judd Stone, questioned by Chief Justice John Roberts. The Supreme Court case Whole Women's Health v. Jackson concerning those private lawsuits allowed under the Texas abortion law against anyone who violates the law. There was a second Supreme Court case today, U.S. v. Texas, and that dealt with whether the U.S. Justice Department can sue Texas over the law. He is part of the oral argument in that case, Justice Clarence Thomas with U.S. Solicitor General Elizabeth Prelogger. Uh, General Prelogger, would you spend a, just a few minutes on uh, the United States interests um, that gives you a basis for being uh, involved in this suit? Of course, Justice Thomas. The interest of the United States here is the sovereign interest in ensuring that states cannot flout the supremacy of federal law by enacting a law that's clearly unconstitutional and then through this simple mechanism of outsourcing enforcement authority to the world at large, blocking the traditional mechanisms for judicial review that, that Congress in Section 1983 and that this court in Ex parte Young recognized would be vital to securing federal constitutional rights against that kind of law. Is there any difference between uh, uh, legislation and uh, uh, precedent of this court as far as the uh, supremacy interests that you have? I think that if a state structured a law in exactly this manner to try to flout uh, this court's precedents, for example, interpreting statutes, that it would raise that same kind of supremacy concern. But of course, here I think that the situation has additional urgency because what Texas has done is taken a constitutional precedent from this court and legislated in direct defiance of that precedent and then tried to, in the words of the interveners, box the judiciary out of the equation and prevent the courts from being able to provide any meaningful form of redress. You, 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 uh, you, you uh, uh, based uh, your involvement quite a bit on Debs. Can you give me a couple ex of examples where the United States has uh, taken a similar action based on Debs? 
I'd be happy to. And I want to acknowledge at the outset that we can't point to a case that looks exactly like this one, and that's because there has never been a law exactly like this one. No state has ever sought to challenge the supremacy of federal law and keep the courts out of the equation in quite the same way. But I think that there are relevant principles to distill from the Debs line of cases. And what the court has said is that the United States cannot come in and seek to intervene in a merely private dispute. It needs to be acting on the basis of the public interest and the public at large. And that further, the subject matter have, of the suit has to be one that concerns and is entrusted to the care of the nation as a whole and for which the nation owes a duty to her citizens. Elizabeth Prelogger, the U.S. Solicitor General, questioned by Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, the case U.S. v. Texas. More from the oral argument with Justice Stephen Breyer and again representing Texas, the Solicitor General, Judd Stone. Let me think about uh, just a specific example, which was the worst one I could think of for you. <laughs> the, the, I mean, suppose the Governor Faubus, uh, you know, had this model law and said anyone who uh, brings a black child to a white school is subject to, you know, and then we copy the law. There we are. Now, if you were in that situation, which I'm sure you're glad you're not, uh, uh, what? What, what would you do? I mean, if we uphold this, are we retroactively upholding that? No, Your Honor. As a matter of fact, for that very specific case, Congress has specifically provided oh, DOJ. No, this is before Congress. I mean, 57, Congress was no help. I mean, believe me, they did nothing. Or if they did something, I'm unaware of it. And if they did something, I assume it out of the hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough, Your Honor. Uh, the answer would be that, the, that there would have to be recourse, again, to the state court. I'm assuming this is a state legislature because we're talking about federal court. This act. was Arkansas in 1957. Sure, Your Honor. And, and that, in fact, that that court would be obligated to apply this court's decisions. That's a transparent violation of the 14th Amendment, of course, Your Honor. We have to assume that state court judges... Yeah, but they didn't. I mean, we, we have some experience. And, and, and most of those cases that came up in that period to this court the judges were aware of that experience, and they tried to shape the law to avoid it. So is there anything you can think of? My, I'm getting your answer is no. I, you cannot think of any. The only thing we would have to have said then is, is uh, well, it's up to the state of Arkansas's judges. The problem, Your Honor, is that the number one the number one answer to your question is the thing you've asked me to assume away, which is the thing Congress has actually done, which is in 42 U.S.C. 2000 C6 specifically provided a cause of action for the United States to maintain so a cause of action under the Equal examples? Protection Clause. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer questioning Judge Stone, Texas Solicitor General. And with more on today's cases on Texas's abortion law, we're joined by Washington Post Supreme Court reporter Robert Barnes. Thanks for doing this. What are your takeaways from the oral arguments in these two cases as to which way the justices are leaning? Well, what seemed the most significant uh, about today's oral arguments is that uh, you, you'll remember that this law was allowed to go into effect on September 1st on a really divided and somewhat bitter five to four decision by the Supreme Court. Um, and I think what was stood out today was two of those five, uh, Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett, uh, seemed to think that uh, the abortion providers uh, had a point uh, and that the Texas law was really written in a way that seemed to foreclose judicial scrutiny, even uh, at the state court level. And so I, it seemed significant uh, that those two appeared uh, to say that there should be more judicial review of this law. Uh, for the average person listening, not necessarily knowing all the details of the cases, they might have heard simply that the Roe v. Wade decision from 1973 making abortion a constitutional right is at stake. Is that true? Well, uh, it probably is at stake, but not particularly in this case. Um, you know, this this case is almost one of these cases. Uh, it's important to know what it's not about. Uh, it was not about uh, Roe v. Wade. It was not about the follow up case, which was Planned Parenthood uh, v. Casey. Um, and, and, you know, it, it isn't even about the constitutionality of this Texas law. 
Uh, it is about whether or not the abortion providers uh, have a um, way to and the Justice Department have a way to ask federal courts to step in and stop it uh, while the legal battles go on. The the uh, law has been in effect for about two months now. Um, the Biden administration says that it's virtually shut down um, abortion in the nation's second largest state. And so it's pretty limited what this case uh, is about. Uh, now, later, the court will be taking up a Mississippi law that's a little uh, more uh, usual. It would just attempt to ban abortion after 15 weeks. And Republican-led states and conservative activists have asked the court to use that case to revisit Roe and Casey. Um, but that really wasn't the issue in today's uh, very long three-hour argument. And can you explain a little bit more about how the cases appeared today. It seemed like they were put on the docket pretty fast. Very fast. Um, Usually the court doesn't uh, hear cases so quickly. This was less than two weeks after they said that they were going to hear it. But um, that's partly because, as I say, they turned down uh, the first attempt to have this law stopped before it went into effect two months ago. And so uh, the court has been criticized a lot for uh, deciding these uh, kinds of cases on a, you know, limited uh, briefing and, uh, you know, after just a few days of consideration. And so this is a way, uh, actually, for the court to be a little more transparent, to put these cases on the docket, to have oral arguments in them, uh, to invite briefs from a lot of other people. Uh, and so I think the court has been feeling a little of that Uh, criticism that it was deciding too many important issues on what uh, folks have started to call the shadow docket. And finally, if the oral arguments now take place, uh, usually with a case, we have to wait months for a decision. Could we get a decision on on one or the other cases uh, soon? I think we would get a decision on this case uh, more quickly than usual. Um, Because, as I say, it's not really the law itself that uh, is being judged right now. It is just how uh, those who disagree with the law uh, go about challenging it. And so I think that uh, there's a little more uh, urgency for the court to decide at least that part uh, more quickly. Washington Post Supreme Court reporter Robert Barnes. Read his stories at WashingtonPost.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the Supreme Court today also declined to take a case from religious organizations in New York that challenged a state regulation requiring employer health insurance plans to cover abortions. Three justices said they would have heard the charity's appeal. Clarence Thomas, Samuel Lito, and Neil Gorsuch. But it takes four justices to accept a case. Washington Today continues in a minute. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the new C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you get your podcasts. From CNN, Senator Joe Manchin said he won't support the $1.75 trillion reconciliation bill Democrats are negotiating until there is greater clarity, his words, about the impact it will have on the country's national debt and the economy. A warning sign for Democratic leaders trying to pass a pair of legislative packages key to President Joe Biden's agenda as soon as this week. The CNN article goes on. Manchin also called on the House representatives to pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill and warned in an implicit rebuke to progressives that holding this bill hostage won't work in getting him to support the larger social spending and economic package. Here's Senator Manchin. Last week, the Speaker urged, Speaker Pelosi urged the importance of voting and passing the BIF bill before the President took the world stage overseas and still no action. In my view, this is not how the United States Congress should operate or, in my view, has operated in the past. The political games have to stop. Twice now, the House has balked at the opportunity to send the BIF legislation to the President. As you've heard, There are some House Democrats who say they can't support this infrastructure package 
until they get my commitment on the reconciliation legislation. It is time to vote on the BIF bill, up or down, and then go home and explain to your constituents the decision you made. And I've always said, if I can't go home and explain it, I can't vote for it, and if I can, I, I will. I've worked in good faith for three months, for the past three months, with President Biden, Leader Schumer, Speaker Pelosi, and my colleagues on the reconciliation bill, and I will continue to do so. For the sake of the country, I urge the House to vote and pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Holding this bill hostage is not going to work in getting my support for recon reconciliation bill. Senator Joe Manchin, Democrat from West Virginia, news conference today on Capitol Hill. NBC News White House correspondent Peter Alexander tweeted after President Biden's news conference on Sunday at the G20 Leaders Summit in Rome, thumbs up. As he exited the news conference, I asked President Biden to give a thumbs up if he received a commitment from Manchin and Cinema, referring to Senator Kirsten Cinema, Democrat from Arizona, to support his social climate plan. He appeared to give a thumbs up. Well, today, the White House Principal Deputy Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, asked about this on the flight with Air Force One and the president and reporters from Rome to the Climate Summit in Scotland. I asked about uh, the thumbs up situation yesterday, the thumbs up at the end of the press conference yesterday, the president's thumbs up. You issued a statement saying that he was not, in fact, addressing Senator Manchin and Cinema, but the sort of situation in his his that he felt that the bill was going to pass overall. Did you feel the need to issue that statement because Senator Manchin and Cinema don't have not, in fact, given him a commitment on passing the framework in the final text? No, we issued that statement because there was a lot of chatter amongst all of you about wanting clarification, and we wanted to clarify it for the press. And so that's why I put out that statement yesterday. That's it. And, it, and one of the things that you saw from the president yesterday besides laying out his accomplishments from G20, um, he, he, and when asked about uh, the Build Back, his Build Back Better framework, he was very confident to you, what you just said, Justin, in getting this passed and working closely with legislators on the Hill. And one of the reasons, and he said this, that he put together the framework is because he knew after spending weeks talking to legislators in both chambers and just a broad swath of our, you know, of our d Democratic members, he, he believed this framework would, would get the, the votes that's needed to get passed. Not to put too fine of a point on it, but this is something that progressives on the Hill are really curious about. Do you believe that because it's sort of the natural conclusion of your conversations, or do you believe it because those senators have explicitly said, we will vote to you, to you said, we will vote for this? Well, I get your question. We believe that because we've had those conversations with those senators and House members. Uh, he's had you know, long conversations uh, with progressive members in the Oval Office, in the White House. Uh, very recently, as a week ago, as we know, he met with Congresswoman Jaipal, I believe a week ago today, uh, and spent a long, t a long amount of time with her and had a very good conversation, and others as well. So he believes from the conversations that he has had, one-on-one -on -one conversations, conversations from with my colleagues as well in the White House, that this framework fits what we can get done right now. And one of the things we have to remember is that, as you all know, there is a, you know, the calendar is limited. The White House Principal Deputy Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, with reporters on Air Force One flying from Rome to Great Britain. C-SPAN spoke with Scott Wong, senior staff writer with The Hill, about the status of these two bills, the infrastructure spending bill and the larger social spending and tax bill. Well, Democratic leadership and Joe Biden hope they'll be moved very soon. I mean, we're sort of right near the finish line. We're rounding third base, and it feels like we've sort of been stuck in this position for a number of weeks now. But uh, Democrats who I spoke to feel that they really are on the cusp of something really significant here. Uh, this comes obviously after Joe Biden's visit to Capitol Hill. There's enormous pressure right now on the party to deliver for the president as he is uh, embarking on the uh, at, in, in Glasgow, Scotland for the major cli global climate summit. Uh, election day in Virginia is uh, just a couple days away here tomorrow, in fact. 
uh, for the gubernatorial race. Uh, and so Democrats are feeling enormous pressure to show that when they are in control of government that they can deliver for uh, the people who put them there. And uh, so this is, uh, we say this, it seems every week that this is a significant pivotal week for Democrats. But in this case, I think it really is, uh, you know, the week where they could get something done on both the infrastructure package, the roads and bridges package, as well as the major social and climate spending bill that we call the reconciliation package or build back better. And we saw the framework of that social spending bill released last week. How different do you expect the, the final version that gets voted on if it does get voted on this week? Uh, how different will that final version be from what we saw last week? How much flexibility is there still to add or subtract? Well, there are negotiations happening, uh, you know, even as we speak, these talks after President Biden unveiled uh, the framework for that Build Back Better package on Thursday, uh, talks continued on Friday and through the weekend. Obviously, Bernie Sanders is working to, uh, you know, get some of his main priorities pri primarily, uh, you know, being able to lower the price of, of prescription drugs, having uh, Medicare be able to negotiate lower prices. That is still something that we thought had been left out of this package, but it looks like talks are continuing among moderates and Democrats, specifically Scott Peters of California in the House is working with Energy and Commerce Chairman Frank Pallone uh, on the, in the lower chamber. Talks are continuing uh, in, in the upper chamber between Kirsten Sinema, one of those key senators who's holding the process up uh, as well as some of the more progressive senators. And so uh, it looks like some significant movement, at least on uh, lowering the cost of prescription drugs. It may be a much scaled back uh, plan than what Bernie Sanders had initially proposed, uh, maybe covering not as many drugs as, as was in that original plan. But it does seem like there are some tweaks that could be happening in these next you know, 48 hours or so, the leadership really has told Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer really have told Democrats, look, if you want any changes to President Biden's package, you need to move now and quickly. Uh, and that's why you're sort of seeing this flurry of activity happening, including Kirsten Gillibrand on the Senate floor late last week, who had uh, basically cornered Joe Manchin and was trying to twist his arm to get him to agree to uh, some form of bringing back paid family leave into the Build Back Better proposal. These conversations are happening uh, all throughout the Congress uh, through text message and, and uh, over the phone and, and in person in, in many cases. Uh, it's really crunch time for the Democrats. Scott Wong is a senior staff writer with The Hill, joining C-SPAN on the Washington Journal program Monday morning. On Wall Street today, the Dow up 94, NASDAQ up 97, S&P up 8. On coronavirus, this from Associated Press, anticipating a green light from vaccine advisors, the Biden administration is assembling and shipping millions of COVID-19 shots for children ages 5 to 11, the White House said Monday. The first could go into kids' arms by midweek. On Tuesday, a special advisory panel to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will meet to consider detailed recommendations for administering the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine to younger children. Food and Drug Administration already cleared the shots, which deliver about a third of the vaccine given to adults. After CDC advisors make their recommendations, Agency Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky will give the final order. That from AP. Jeff Zients is the White House COVID-19 Response Coordinator getting a question at today's virtual briefing. So, Jeff, this question is for you. Can you say exactly how many pediatric vaccine doses will be available come Wednesday if all goes as planned? And if states were able to pre-order as early as October 20th, can you explain why, why parents might have to wait until that week of November 8th for a full rollout, as you just suggested? So the FDA, thank you for the question first. Um, the FDA authorization was the trigger uh, regulatorily and that would allow that allowed for the beginning of the picking packing shipping process and that started immediately within minutes of the fda decision as i said people have been working 24 7. we expect that uh, several million doses are already en route uh, to sites around the country and across the next week or so 
uh, 15 million or so doses uh, will be around the country at convenient and trusted sites. So that's why we are um, uh, planning on some vaccinations towards the end of this week, but the program for kids ages 5 through 11 really hitting full strength the week of November 8th. Jeff Zines is the White House COVID-19 response coordinator. The American Academy of Pediatrics reporting that 6.4 million children have been infected with COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic, and that includes 100,000 new cases in the past week. This from the New York Daily News. Mayor Bill de Blasio on Monday attacked city firefighters for feigning illness to protest vaccination mandates and promised consequences for those who don't report to their jobs. De Blasio employed the threatening rhetoric on the first day that city employees who've refused to get the the vaccine can be docked pay for doing so. As of Monday morning, he said a total of 9,000 city workers are on leave without pay, about 6 percent of the entire city workforce, which is approximately 370,000 strong, reporting from the New York Daily News. Mayor de Blasio gave an update today at a news conference. Uh, the, The firefighters' unions are saying that a big part of a problem for them and their members is that they were only given nine days to comply with the vaccination mandate, as opposed to the 30 or more days that, for instance, DOE and Department of Correction employees have been given. Can you, and maybe Commissioner Nigro as well, please respond to this complaint and how these members are also saying for them this could be a life-changing decision because they may decide whether or not to retire based on this decision and they only had nine days in which to do it well james i I appreciate the question i'll start and i'll turn to commissioner nigro after i mean right now uh again among firefighters 77 percent have gotten vaccinated among EMS 88%. Um, I think that is extremely clear evidence uh, that there was enough time to make a decision and people made the right decision overwhelmingly and others will come in now and get vaccinated. Remember, first we asked our public health workers uh, to go get vaccinated under mandate. Then we asked everyone to work to Department of Education, our biggest agency, and we kept saying we're climbing the ladder. Uh, There's more to come. There was lots of time for people to think about this. Uh, We had the phase of uh, vaccinate or test. There was lots of time, there were lots of incentives, but it's been quite clear uh, this was the direction we're going in and it's the right thing to do. So I would argue, in fact, people had plenty of evidence to make a decision on and we welcome them now to make the right decision if they're not yet vaccinated, protect Uh, Their careers doing incredible work in the most amazing agencies in the world, really. Uh, And it's time for people to come in and get vaccinated. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, a Democrat news conference today. The 9,000 or so city workers on unpaid leave now for failing to get COVID-19 vaccines includes not only firefighters, but police officers, emergency medical responders and sanitation workers. Fox News writes it is leaving the Big Apple bracing for the possibility of closed firehouses, fewer police and ambulances, and mounting trash. And also Mayor Bill de Blasio said the sanitation department will move to 12-hour shifts as opposed to the usual 8-hour shifts and begin working Sundays to ensure trash doesn't pile up. The COVID-19 pandemic is less than two years old, hitting another grim milestone today. Worldwide, over 5 million people have died. The United States has the most deaths of any country, over 745,000. Number two is Brazil, more than 607,000. And then India, over 450,000. Thanks for listening today to Washington Today. And for more top Washington stories, subscribe to C-SPAN's evening newsletter, Word for Word, at c-span.org forward slash connect. Hope you have a good night.